Hello everyone. Are, are we back? Is there anybody else we are anticipating to come back? Yeah. We're good? Okay. That was me. Oh, that was you. <laughs> All right. I hope you enjoyed the sumptuous lunch that we had. Yeah? And you were also able to gorge upon fantastic conversations. <clears throat> yeah? I think I had good ones with a bunch of you. Yeah, interesting ones. Okay, all right. Uh, let's dive right into the next session. Let me introduce our next speaker. Yes. Ah, <laughs> so, how's the Josh? Super high. Super high? Oh, fantastic. I'm going to take the credit. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, okay. Let's talk about the next uh, session. Um, very interesting topic. I found it very, very interesting. It says, in today's fast-paced business environment, enterprises are under constant pressure to evolve and stay competitive. However, the journey to transformation is often filled with challenges, which is part of this. Yeah. Now, um, it can pan across managing legacy systems to fostering effective leadership to ensuring continuous in innovation. Yeah? Our next speaker will help us explore three compelling stories which will highlight a few of the most critical elements of successful enterprise transformation with real world examples and that is what intrigued me the most. Sharing real-time examples, real-world examples, self-experience is what makes the sessions way more interesting, right, rather than a typical verbatim. Okay, please join me to welcome Puneet Doshi. He is a digital transformation expert, has a vision, a very interesting one at that, has a vision to be a long-term partner for individuals, teams and organizations who want to challenge the status quo, to generate value for their customers and be successful in this increasingly competitive world. Big round of applause for Puneet. Thanks, Sharshika. That was a mouthful. So, uh, something unique about this session. It's right after lunch. <laughs> Let me rephrase. It's right after a very tasty lunch. And I'm supposed to talk about fixing your enterprise transformations in 30 minutes. So it's going to be a unique challenge. I know 30 minutes is never going to be enough to talk about transformations and fixing. If there are any broken pieces, that you, how do we identify them? And what can we do to make it move in the right direction? Right? That's the entire intention. Because let me ask this. Most of us are working in enterprises, right? Uh, how many of you have been long enough in the organization to see the transformation? At least like a couple of years? Okay, some of you have. Okay. How many of you have been to organization that have already started transformation and now you are just sustaining it? Okay. So pretty much I, I would say most of the audience have seen this, right? So the intention out here is um, there's always a question like, hey, we have invested in the transformation. How do we know that it's get, getting us the returns that we, are, uh, we were expecting? So let's move forward. Whoops. Um, let me talk about who, who I represent. So I am part of Practice Agile Solutions organization. It's two individuals, Hiren Doshi. I shared a copy of his book across all tables. So there are ample copies. I have extra copies over here. If you want it, get it, OK? So this is a book written by the founder of Practice Agile Solutions, Hiren Doshi, and it is an extension to Scrum Guide. So if you want to read it, get a little bit more deeper dive into Scrum, go for it. Uh, it was founded in the year 2010, and we have more than 35 clients. Um, between Hiren and I, we have trained more than 10,000 uh, participants in Scrum, in Agile ways of working, all the way from leadership, uh, Scrum master, product ownership, uh, developers, you name it, we have done it. Uh, we are licensed trainers. Collectively, we both have more than 50 years of experience. I have about 23 years of experience. And in my case, specifically, I have been with different banks. 
I have worked with different banks for more than 12 years. I have seen the transformations up close in pretty much at least five different banks right now. So just would like to share some stories of what we have seen happening. So my intention is in the next uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes that we have, I'm going to talk about three stories. These are all related to the transformation that I've seen happen. So it's a good time to tell stories, right? It's after lunch. <laughs> Otherwise, if I go into theory, you will be like, oh. Okay, so let's go for it. Let's uh, start with the first story, from clutter to ca uh, clarity. So imagine this. We are working in a large bank. It has like, for one line of business, it has more than 10,000 people working in technology alone. Just technology alone, 10,000 employees. Third party suppliers, even more, okay? Uh, this bank has been around for more than a century. And over time, it has merged with other banks. It has acquired other smaller banks. And what happens when you acquire other smaller banks? You also inherit their systems. So now, the bank is having to support its own apps. With the apps, it had already, you know, from the other banks that it has uh, taken over. So what happens because of that? There's a complex web of legacy applications. This generated a lot of chaos. Now, imagine if you have such a big bank, and you have a, a lot of legacy systems. So because of that, the team members were stretched too thin. They were working on different applications together in one shot. So everyone is working at least on one and a half, maybe two applications, okay? And then what happens if you have, how many of you are aware of systems thinking where we say one person working on one product versus one person working on multiple product, how it affects the productivity of that person. If you have heard it, you would know the more number of products you are working on, your productivity goes down because your brain is not hardwired to switch context. And this was a chronic problem, okay? And because of that, people were working long hours, they were, uh, the morale was going low because the legacy app is something that a lot of team members were not enjoying or happy with, right? Uh, high maintenance and uh, cost. So this was the situation, and they roped us in saying like, okay, we need to do something about it. So how do we move about it? Whoops. So the first step we did is to start with a survey. The survey where we reached out to all the employees saying like, as much as possible, fill out the survey. The survey was about what? Number one, how much clarity they have on the purpose and strategy of the organization. Number two, about the leadership mindset. How do the people perceive their leaders to, uh, you know, the culture that they are building? Number three, it was about processes they are, uh, that they are following. Number four, it was about the metrics that they are measuring. How, what kind of metrics are we dealing with? Number five, it was about the governance. How much clarity they have on the governance. Number six, it was about how we are forming teams. And number seven, it was about the technology. So in each of these areas, we started having like probed questions to get a pulse of how the teams are perceiving. Afterwards, we reached out to a big group of people, at least about 50 of them. We interviewed them. These were like senior leaders, the managers, uh, the architects, the senior uh, technologists in the organization to get hear from them firsthand what are they thinking, what, what, what are the pain points that they are having, right? So we started with that and then based on our observations, plus we also attended some of their meetings, the forums that they are, uh, you know, taking decisions in. We started doing all this to understand what's going on. We figured out that there were 2,000 plus applications in just this line of business. I'm talking about private banking. Private banking means a brick and mortar bank we, where we go, open an account, operate it, uh, you know, get loans. So just in this itself, they had 2,000 applications. The number is mind boggling just for this 2,000 applications. Then we worked with the CIO, his technology officers, and the architects to now look at those 2,000 applications and segregate them into three buckets. The first bucket is a list of applications which we know there is value in them. We invest in them. We build more functionality which we know our customers will be happy to accept. These were invest bucket. 
The second bucket was maintain or maintenance, where we know that these applications serve the purpose. We just have to do limited to maintain them. And the third one was diverse bucket. Now diverse bucket is the one where these are legacy apps which are painful to maintain. These are the legacy apps. There are some users, we wish we can just migrate them, but we are stuck with it because there is no alternative to it. And based on that, we realized that there were 400 applications which were into diverse bucket. Then the actual action started. We decided with the CIO, let's start to, uh, looking at these 400 applications, see how we can slowly migrate the users into other applications or newer applications so that we can slowly move out of these diverse apps, the legacy apps. This was a long journey. The name we gave it was Cut the Fat Program. The moment we say Cut the Fat Program, what happens? People interpret it differently. When we talk about Cut the Fat, people are like, God damn it, these buggers are laying off. And we wanted to make sure that people understand it's not about laying off. We don't want to lay off any employee. We have enough talent. These are the people we have invested in. So we went around, we started getting the buy-ins from the team members to make them understand that no one's losing their job. We are happy to upskill them, see if there are other, we partner with the HR to say which are the other job opportunities internally we can migrate them to. So by doing this, we got most of the people's buy-in and then underwent like a multi-year function where we said, okay, let's slowly move the people away from these diverse tap. By doing this, the impact that it generated was good. Number one, it freed up the capacity of the employees. Now, instead of focusing on multiple apps, they had a narrower focus. So now they were able to focus on more creative work, more innovative work. And by that, it helped them maintain that focus and see that, hey, we are contributing to something good. They saw value in it, it improved the employee satisfaction. The other part of it, we started saving on the infra. We started saving on the licenses. By doing this, the bank saved like multi-million dollars of licensing cost. That was leveraged for more creative work. So imagine this, over time, the amount of maintenance-related uh, investment in technology started going down, and more budget was spent on innovation, okay? This helped, it also helped the, as a, what do you it, it improved the reliability of the systems that we were supporting, okay? So just a quick story about this. There were, uh, there were employees who were very apprehensive. It took a lot of convincing. We wanted to make sure that people feel that, hey, this is not about cutting cost and laying off people. It was definitely not. We were able to sustain it. And what we did is at one point we decided, okay, if there are any attrition happening, natural attrition, people are moving out, Instead of looking outside, if there is capacity in-house, people who are getting freed from the uh, legacy app, are they interested in those apps? Uh, do they want to take up that work? Most of them were happy. We moved them into that area. Okay, I see some sleepy faces, huh? Okay, guys, how many of you had teachers who, when you were really sleepy or something in the class, they would pinch your ears and twist and no one? Yeah? serious You had. Okay, you had. Okay, three of us. Good. Others, God bless you all. Those teachers were boon for us. Why? I'll tell you why. You see, this part of the year has a lot of nerves. They connect to our brain cells. So when you pinch it and it hurts a bit, you'll realize it. It makes you alert. I'm not going to judge you if you do that. Okay, cool. So story number one. Let me ask you all this. What is the lessons learned for you in this story? Understanding the customer pain or the user pain is important. Understanding the user pain is important. Yeah, great. Anything else? Making it transparent to the team uh, about hmm. what the plan is and why that plan is. Making it transparent to the team, great. Trust Communication, them. communicate with people, great. More? Trust and reliability. Sorry? Trust. Trust and reliability. Let me tell you my learning. In any transformation, you want to also look at systemic approach. Like, hey, let's look at the larger picture. 
to identify where are our investment leaks. The sooner you plug the holes in those that, hey, we are investing in these areas, our money is going into these pockets, it's definitely not worth it, the better it is. Because as an organization, if you are not innovating more, then you are just struggling to stay uh, alive in the competition. You want to innovate. So that's why it's definitely good for you to figure out, hey, where are our investment leaks? The other part, which is very important, I don't know how many of you have heard this statement, stop starting and start finishing. How many of you have seen the organizations where there are initiatives after initiatives? So when you have multiple initiatives running in parallel and you have fewer people, what do we do? These initiatives are like, you know, that, uh, what do you call it, tug of war kind, they keep pulling, like, hey, this is my person, we are, ear we are earmarking this person. And that's where all this happens, because you have too many initiatives. And this is where the saying goes, right? A lot of companies die out of indigestion rather than starvation. I hope no one over here is going to be having indigestion tonight. <laughs> you know, people had good food. I can see it in the eyes. Before lunchtime, I, I kid you not, before lunchtime, the shutters were up. Now the shutters have come down halfway, and my job, thanks to Sanjay, is to pull them back up. <laughs> OK, so this is the first story. Um, I'm thinking whether I want to take up the second story, which might be a little dry, but let's do it. Um, so for the bank, the investment, the transformation investment has been running for quite a few years now. What happens is usually for any organization which is going through transformation, when they pilot the transformation, uh, they see short-term successes. These short-term successes now makes a business case like, hey, we have to scale. We have to do it across the organization. We start implementing. So then we go into big bang, like waves after waves, like, hey, these, uh, these teams will go into agile ways of working. That program will be run in agile ways of working. We keep doing that till we scale. And then when we rapidly scale, the bigger challenge that comes in is tracking the impact of the investment on the initiative, right? So you have invested. How do we know we are successful? What do we measure, right? The other part is more and more, you, the larger the organization, the strategic investment decisions become more and more transclusive. The transparency goes out of the window over time. I won't say fully, but the transparency is not there. It's murkier. So what do we do? We went into this situation and said, okay, let's do this. Let's understand as a bank, how are we measuring our success? So as a bank, they had KPIs. Like, hey, these are the KPIs we are going to measure. We want to see our employ uh, sorry, customer satisfaction go up. We want to see our uh, time to market go up. We want to see our employee satisfaction to go up. These are the typical metrics that most of the banks measure to say like, hey, are we doing right, right? So now from that, the next step was identify a chain of OKRs that link from your KPIs to uh, business strategy all the way down to product level OKRs. So we, build, uh, we started building the OKRs that uh, added up to the strategic KPIs, so strategic uh, K, uh, OKRs, and then to the next level tactical OKRs, all the way till product level, and if need be, even to the function that we are delivering. Like, hey, what are the key results we are going to deliver? Okay, how are we going to measure them? So we started with that, and these had to be all chained together. So the best thing to do is ask, like, why is this OKR necessary? Chain of whys, right? What would happen if we don't deliver this? How is it going to impact? And based on that, we came up with the list. That was the next set. And then we provided the bank with different uh, framework, decision-making framework, like, hey, feasil uh, feasibility versus impact. We are talking about Eisenhower uh, model. We are talking about, uh, you all have heard of Moscow. So we provided different frameworks for them to say, like, leverage these and make it transparent. because. One of the things that happened is, during the discussions for deciding where or which investment are we going to make, there were a lot of debates. Every product owner is passionate, right? Hey, this is the product, this is the product, this is what we are going to do, give me the money. So what happens when the product owner is passionate and pushing for it, and the, the person who's signing off the check is saying like, bhai, dheere, dusre log bhi maang rahe. So there is a lot of push and pull. And when that happened, usually the response I always heard in the forum, let's take it offline. Have you heard that in meetings? Like, let's take it offline. 
So that basically means like, bhool ja, nahi mil raha. Okay, so people started complaining like, why is it that my investment or my initiative is getting struck down? So we said, okay, let's make it more transparent. Okay, and the third aspect that we focused on was obeya room. Obeya is a Japanese word for war room or big room. Okay, so obeya room, we wanted to set this up, not a physical room, of course, because everyone's in virtual world. Uh, we decided let's set up a virtual room where these four areas can be made transparent. What is our business strategy? What are our key priorities? What's the roadmap? Okay, so that's the first level. This would be at the line of business level. And then from there, we build the portfolio. Hey, for that, to achieve the, uh, the, to achieve the roadmap, whatever roadmap we have, what is the portfolio of uh, products and the program that we are going to run? Which ones are within the line of business? Which ones are going to be cross line of business uh, collaboration effort? So we had the portfolio. And then for the key metrics and the OKRs, we had a separate area where these were all listed and whichever ones, the progress on each of them, we started putting them together. Now this was initially manually done with the intention automate as much as possible over time. Okay, so that we don't keep replicating the effort. So that was the other one. And then finally, across all the products, the program that we are running, I'm sure you have seen impediments. A lot of us deal with impediments. We wanted to make sure that those impediments were amply, they were amplified. And for doing that, we said, okay, let's put them together in one of the walls on the, in the OBR room. So by doing this, we started to build transparency in the system that, hey, why are we doing what we are doing? How are we doing in terms of our performance? And this wasn't at just uh, CXO level. We said CXO level is one. We go down to the, the director level, the vice president level, and then all the way to uh, product level. So this roadmap, all these levels, based on the forum, they were rolled up or drilled down so that the audience, for which it makes sense, they can see those particular uh, list in all four walls. Am I making sense to everyone? Okay, good. Question. What are the lessons learned? Yes. Great point. Someone wants to add? Yes? Alignment from top to bottom. Alignment from top to bottom. Because that's where you can find out, are we doing the right thing? Great point. Anything else? Yeah, that side is very quiet. All okay, na? Ghar pe koi mara mari hui hai kya? Nahi, sab okay, thumbs up. Acha, thumbs up de ya bolne wale ho? Thumbs up there, okay, okay. How about this side, anyone wants to add? Sorry? Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Great point. Now let me put it, transparency in measuring objectives at all levels and their contribution towards the strategic goals, okay? The ability to measure impact of initiatives on KPIs over time, it provided validation on the return on investment. Okay, because it's not just about, hey, uh, did we deliver? We may have delivered, did it create the impact? We want to measure that, right? And finally, the OBR room became a great way to keep things transparent across the board. That, hey, people can see what's going on. They see the big picture, they see how they are contributing, they see whether we are able to meet the, uh, you know, the, 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 deliver the key results that we were hoping for, right? So that's the second one. Second story, Adhyay Samapt. Tisra Adhyay. I swear, man, people are so. Yep. Obeya is something that is derived from something else, or because I've heard this name for the first time? Something that was derived, derived from something else. Obeya. No, Obeya, I have heard it before. Okay. So, in uh, let me put it this way, right? For us, Imagine this, Obeya Room is just the term that I'm using, okay? For every organization, I'm sure they always have some way to put these, some, uh, somewhere they should be there in the system. 
What we are trying to do is put them together in one place for everyone to be able to get that complete picture. Uh, a 360 degree perspective of our strategy, of our portfolio, of our uh, how we are doing, and if there are any impediments. We wanted to give that. So collectively we said, let's form this, and the term that we have used is Obeya Room for that. Does that help? When to use it? Just, it sounds good, na? It sounds cool. War, uh, imagine this, imagine this, if I had used the term war room, people will see, feel like what, we are, on, we are at war for the uh, last three years or so, so just avoiding the term war room or big room, big room, big, people will think like, this is a safe ka concept, hai, big room planning and stuff, so just wanted to avoid that. Ah, okay, thanks for adding the insight. Thanks. Collectively, we have a lot more knowledge. So I like it. Thanks for sharing. So, uh, how much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay, then let's quickly go through the third one. Okay, so this is what I call tale of two teams. I am sure you all will be able to relate to. Just want to do a quick run through of it. So I have two teams, team A and team B. Team A had 16, uh, 16 people, one in California, 10 in New York, 2 in Mumbai, and two in, uh, 3 in Chennai. Team B, 2 in New York, 1 in London, 1 in Mumbai, and five, 6 in Bangalore. So you have all, Scrum Master, the product owner, and the developers. Question, which team do you be, uh, believe would do better? Team B, why? Smaller team? Sorry? None of them. Okay, let me add a little bit more context. So team A, whoops, the five people in New York from eight, five of them were working part-time, meaning they were working on some other product as well. Okay, this resulted into collaboration issues. In terms of the time zone difference, if you look at the California time versus India time, there was almost no overlap. It was like 12 hour window, so people hardly got a chance to collaborate. So because of that, collaboration became difficult in team A and most of the people started working in uh, silos. And the other part is, the people in Mumbai and Chennai were added toward the last leg of the delivery. Not added, last leg of the delivery, they were added later. So they were brand new to the product, they were brand new to the organization as well, and they were feeling isolated. So because of that, they were struggling, okay? So they were having difficulties achieving the sprint goal. Team B on the other side, the team size was 10, less than 10, okay? Uh, the people who are working in remote location, or not remote location, but individually, like one in Mumbai, one in London, these were people with niche skills and had deep understanding of the product. So they were able to contribute without much support from their side, okay? What we did is, since team one failed, or uh, team A failed, we decided, let's do this we are going to bring the team members together, all the ones in India, we brought them together in one location for three months. We said, okay, let's work together for three months. Two of them were, not two, about three of them were from third party suppliers, like vendors, so we brought them together. Initially, there were some hurdles, but over time, they managed to overcome that barrier, that hey, this is from this organization, that, that person from that organization. They overcame that barrier, they became a great team. And afterwards, we gave them like, hey, if you want to stay together, come, continue staying together. If you want to go back to your base location, go for it, as long as you continue collaborating. By doing this, they were able to deliver on sprint goals, they performed well, and at the end of six months, we had our first release, the big release. And the architect who was in Mumbai, he made a brilliant comment. He said, if we had continued the way we usually do, like how it was in team A, we would have delivered whatever we delivered in six months, we would have, it would have taken us two years. 
And that guy was one of the people who would always hold his ground and he would say like this agile way of working is nonsense. Coming from him was a great achievement because he said, I see why you were coaching us differently. And he was finding value in it. So long story short, Avoid fragmentation, meaning as much as possible, allocate people to one product, not multiple products. I understand for niche skills, you may have to. And secondly, invest in technology. More face-to-face -face communication. Use Zoom. Use uh, any, any way in which the team members can have face-to-face -face collaboration. Invest in travels. Make the team come together once in a while. It will help. Again, this is about experimentation. So if I look at it, the first story is about looking at the systemic picture, big picture. The second story is about amplifying the feedback. And third story is about experimentation. Anyone able to grasp why I'm saying this? Exactly. DevOps, the three ways of, dev of DevOps also is about similar thing. Big picture, systemic view, amplify the feedback loop, and third, experiment as much as you can. So that's the stories. These are the stories I wanted to share. In case you enjoyed, you felt that this was a great learning and you want to stay connected with me, uh, that's my LinkedIn profile. You can scan it and uh, we'll be happy to connect. Any questions? Yeah. You still have augmented teams uh, even now, Sorry. right? Yep. Like uh, most of the scenarios, post-COVID that we are seeing is team A kind of things nowadays. We have remote working, and even if we are co-located or we are in the same geography, not everyone is uh, willing to come to office with the same. Right. So at this current moment, how do you feel uh, with the kind of culture that team A is the way we have to go and there is no change? Mm -hmm. Then how can we provide success in that area? So I'll put it this way, right? Um, if you are working remotely, like how we are in hybrid mode. Uh, of course, the best is to have everyone in the same location, which is not practical right now. The next best is always going to be at least have a video call. Okay, you have, uh, you know, you, you have tools like Zoom. If you are having a Zoom call, let me ask you all this. How many of your Zoom calls people turn on the camera? Everyone? Only you. Okay, so why I'm saying that? Because usually what happens is when you turn off the cameras, people have that inherent itch to do multitasking. And that's when you ask a question, oh, sorry, I was talking on mute. Oh, can you repeat, repeat that again? I didn't catch you. What does that truly mean? Basically, they were not paying attention, right? So the next best is, I would say, if you are going to have video, uh, if you are going to collaborate, do it over a video call with the cameras on, okay? That's the next thing to do. The third, which is worse, which is going to be like no cameras, just phone call. And the last is email communication. If one is not possible, go for the second one. I don't know if that helps. The second part I want to add is also the time zone overlap, at least have three to four hours of overlap between team members because we are going on distribute, distributed geography. Your team can only collaborate if they have time to collaborate together. There is a dedicated office hour. So one suggestion I give is for the team to have a team norm or working agreement that says, hey, between this hour to this hour, India time, US time, whatever time, we will collaborate together as a team. So that way, during that time, all the team members will be available. Beyond that, you may have your separate working hours. So have that overlap and make it dedicated. During this time, we are going to have team collaboration meetings. Beyond that, you can do your individual work. So that way, you at least have that open channel to communicate with each other. So just a few tips. It will at least reduce your problem to some degree. I won't say it will let it go away. I agree. OK, any other questions? OK, if no question, that means people understood or people fell asleep. I hope it's understood. Yes? Uh, so. Uh, uh, Following up on that question, which uh, you already answered. So how do we push? You have all, you already told us that we, you move, motivated us, basically. Mm. So how do we motivate the Other. team members to come into camera at 9 AM in the morning? Ek baat batao. Simple <laughs> solution. Simple solution. Uh, during the retrospective, bring it up. 
and say, can we experiment for next two sprints? Already done that. Then we don't do it. What is the problem? What is the problem in the house? Fighting or something? Meaning, uh, go, if the team members are not motivated to turn on the cameras or not having a phone call, you have to have that one-to-one -one conversation to ask them, like, what's stopping you? There has to be a valid reason. If someone says, no, you're Kantala. What the hell, Kantala? I don't care, man. Your Kantala is not helping the team collaborate. The other way to look at it is, if by if they are not doing this, it's okay. But is the team collaborating or working in silos? If they are working in silos, I would suggest collaborate with your product owner and your uh, leadership to say, hey, can we invest for two months to bring the team together in one location? Invest on travel. Say, Ki boss, for two months you are going to travel, whatever it is, six weeks. Karlo, yaar. You start with two months, it will come down to six weeks. Six weeks, let them travel make them sit together for six weeks, what will happen is it will become an icebreaker. Okay, afterwards, let them go back. That will definitely make them collaborate better. But when they are together, be very mindful. Huh? Uh, yeah, uh, from my side it's done, that per it's now with that person. That me, you, us, them attitude is not going to help. You as a coach, are you a coach? Or? Okay. Project manager. Okay, so I will say you are still a coach. You are coaching them, right? So. You may want to coach them to say, Ki boss, it's a collective success or collective failure. If, if that person fails, you fail. It's not like, Achha, well, this is that person's responsibility. Collectively, entire team fails. So if this person doesn't deliver, boss, the buck is on all of you, not just that person. So bring that, thoda sa, it will need some better push in that case. After, day after tomorrow, they close the camp. So that's the problem statement. They have to keep giving regular notice. Yes, yes. <laughs> so if, if they turn off the camera, you, that's why I'm saying document it in the team working agreement. Just, you know, project the team working agreement and say, hey guys, is this still relevant? Team working agreement that we will turn the cameras on. Or link them with their huh. Don't yeah. escalate immediately. Kuch log to kaise on nahi karte So as a coach, you said that you made that, you know, the transformation program name as a cut the fat. Sorry. You were saying? So I said that the transformation hmm. name which you put for the case. Fixing and Cut the fat. Cut the fat. What was the essence when you thought about, like, why this is the name, not the other name, something like that? Because we were reducing the application, right? From 2,000 applications, we are going down to 1,600. But still, I'm saying that what was in the back of the mind when you said that cut the fat? Because the, what you said, hmm. the direct meaning to any person, if you talk, that the yeah. question is thinking of cutting the fat. Yeah, earlier. Or goods goes off and all that. That's directly, like, you know, yeah. impacting the people there. I know. So earlier, we thought about kill the tail. That the leadership will think of that then. I would rather cut than kill. <laughs> so, sorry, we didn't have. I, 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 I wish we had I a better mean, phrase you know, to why? say like becoming lean. The, the yeah, people so are like, are all kitna lean hona. I think why I'm asking because like you know this the, the, when we say that the people process and tool impacts in the transformation. Yeah. And I think the the, the catalyst is the people. Rest hmm. can you know apply it anyway. Like process you can create tools you can bring. Hmm. But this catalyst which is the people is a hard to change, hard to manage. And if you already giving a Cut. Such a name, <laughs> like it's like cut the fat, that's a, that's a tough and challenging so, uh, People, actually, some people even said, is it cut the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, cut the fat or cut the crap? Cut. Break the uh, people, uh, so I'm sorry, but uh, I'm using explicit right now, but unfortunately, that's what it was at time. <laughs> okay. No. Thank you. Probably lady in the back in the sari. Can you do the honors, please? 